and welcome to the May edition of .edu Live, our monthly policy discussion. I am your host, John Fansmith, and joining me today is my wonderful co-host, Sarah Spreitzer. Sarah, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm loving this new live format. I think it's it's a great way to interact with folks. Um, I'm still recovering from the annual meeting where we did two live podcasts, and that was really great. Um, and more importantly, I'm recovering from a vacation that I took after the annual meeting. So um, just catching up on stuff this week, uh, seeing what's going on. So did I miss anything big while I was out of the office, John? Yeah, and you were very out of the office, Sarah. Do you want to tell people where you were vacationing? I mean, I was in France. Yeah. Are you going to ask me to say something in French? Because I can't, I really can't no, do that. I, I wouldn't ask. Okay. I just want to emphasize that you and another one of our colleagues was also in France immediately after the annual meeting while I was yeah. here. So I don't. I just, sorry, sorry about that. A it was a good time. It was a good time to take vacation, though. Definitely. It's, it sounded like a good time to take vacation. Um, but Sarah, I don't think people want to hear me complain about not taking vacation. <laughs> they probably tuned in because they want to hear a little bit more about the things we told them we'd be talking about, uh, which is what's oh, yeah, happening. That's right. Yeah, right. Those things. Uh, what's happening here in Washington? So what's happening here in Washington? Well, uh, I believe that the House Republicans passed some sort of uh, budget bill while I was I was gone um, and attached it to a debt limit increase. Um, so anything interesting in there? Yeah. So this is this is this is big news, right? This is frankly what Congress really is only focusing on at this moment. Um, you know, stepping back to your point. The you know the House Republicans passed a debt limit bill that would be uh, essentially uh, raise the debt ceiling by one and a half trillion dollars or extend the debt ceiling to March, whichever comes first. Uh, in order to do that, they wanted to offset it with about four point eight uh, trillion dollars in cuts. So pretty significant cuts proposed. A couple things that are interesting about it. Uh, the first is that. We are looking at fiscal year uh, 24. We're currently in fiscal year 23. Uh, the uh, now I always forget what the name of this bill. Save limit grow. What was the act? What was the Pago? No, no I, the, I don't. The remember. House bill has a has a. Anyway. I was on vacation. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, anyway, it would take back spending for FY24 to right. FY22 levels. And mm -hmm. if you go back to the FY22 levels or big increases in FY23, it's about $130 billion cut in funding. And all of that cut would come from the non-defense side. So there are increases to defense, increases to non-defense, but the cuts would come entirely from non-defense. And that would be about a 22 or 23% cut, depending on which estimates you're looking at. Uh, that would be massive cuts to the programs we care about, things like student financial aid and scientific research and institutional support. Um, beyond even those massive proposed cuts, the bill would say that federal spending could only grow by 1% each year for each of the next 10 years. That's far below the average of annual increases Congress puts forward. Um, and then really, maybe the thing that was most interesting is how much of this bill focused on higher ed specifically. Uh, there were really five big components of the bill, the limits on spending, uh, rescinding money that hasn't been spent yet, that was COVID relief money that was sent out, uh, rolling back a bunch of green energy tax credits and, and programs, uh, things around limiting uh, social benefit programs like SNAP, uh, essentially tying eligibility to those programs to more stringent work requirements and expanding the ages at which people have to participate in those. So really five things. Those are the other four. The fifth was higher ed, and there was a lot mm -hmm. on higher ed there. And it's really reflective of how strongly congressional Republicans dislike what the Biden administration is doing around student loans. They This bill would propose that um, the student loan forgiveness program, which is currently awaiting a decision by the Supreme Court, it would bar that from going forward. Uh, it would bar the administration, the Department of Education has a proposal for income-driven repayment program that would be the most generous loan repayment program out there. Uh, it would bar that from going into effect. It would end the student loan repayment pause. So that's set to resume likely around the end of August. Uh, it would end that immediately. And then one thing that's 
kind of unusual and, and, and pretty interesting. It would also bar the Department of Education from doing any regulations that increase the cost of the student loan program. So anything that would make the student loan programs more generous, they would be barred from doing. So as you can see, not just this sort of heavy emphasis on higher ed, but a really tight focus on limiting what the Biden administration has done on student loans. Well, and thanks to our wonderful colleague, Amanda Winterstein from Penn State, she um, she reminded us that the bill's called the Limit Save Grow Act. And, you know, John, we saw the uh, the president released his budget right uh, early in, in March. Now we have the Republican budget. Does any of this actually matter? Yeah, so so it matters for a couple of reasons. And and I think uh, in some ways I buried the lead here a little bit. Uh, the reason we care about the debt ceiling limit is there's lots of reasons to care about this. There's global economic implications um, beyond even the House proposal, which has a big impact on higher ed. Uh, most importantly, we don't have a whole lot of time, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Yesterday, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said that they believe the X date, the date at which Treasury's ability to keep meeting our obligations through so-called extraordinary measures. Uh, that date uh, is June 1st. So we hit the limit on June 1st, according to Treasury. Mm. Uh, no need to remind folks, today is May 2nd. That's <laughs> not very far away. The other thing to keep in mind is, you know, the president has put forward his proposals. What he said is just raise the debt limit. They did it three mm -hmm. times. Congress did it three times during the Trump administration with no ties to spending cuts or anything else, just clean increases in the debt limit. Um, that's what the president would like. Uh, as we've seen, the House has a much more uh, aggressive approach to cutting spending that they want to accompany any increase in limit. They are very far apart. Uh, and again, it is May 2nd, X date is apparently June 1st. There's not a lot of time to close the gap between two proposals that are so far apart. Um, it's uh, not a great situation. The president has invited the four uh, majority and minority leaders from both chambers into the White House to meet on May 9th, uh, next week, a week from today. Uh, that will be the first time the president has spoken with Kevin McCarthy directly about the debt ceiling limits since the beginning of February. So there really has been no progress and we have two very strong oppositional positions. The Senate's not doing a whole lot in this debate, although um, Majority Leader Schumer is apparently preparing a clean debt limit increase bill mm -hmm. just in case they can get agreement to do that. Seems unlikely they will. Uh, but there is a lot happening here. There's not a lot of time to do it and a lot of ground to cover up in their negotiations. Yeah, and one of the questions that we got, John, um, for for this uh, uh, public policy update was, you know, what if we if we actually default um, with our creditors or or Congress is unable to raise the debt limit, what does that mean for institutions of higher education? Yeah, so it's it's a good question in part because we have never defaulted. Uh, we don't know exactly what will happen in the case of a default. Uh, it does not it doesn't work the same way, or at least the expectations is it will not work the same way a government shutdown will. The government will not shut down because we're defaulting on our obligations. What we have seen in previous times when we've even gotten close to not meeting the debt limit is the markets react, interest rates start to skyrocket. Uh, there's some other economic impacts. The broad expectation, if we do default, is that it might trigger a global recession. Again, this is not specific to higher ed, but you know we saw the impact of a global recession in 2008. States started cutting back their support for higher education. Lots of people suddenly became unemployed. Uh, large numbers of them enrolled in higher education to you know, improve their skills in the competitive job market. Uh, you combine those two things, both surging enrollments and declining state support. Uh, you really put a lot of financial struggle into institutions who are really struggling with the impact of that. Uh, you mm -hmm. add to that the fact that in a recession, you have lots more students with significantly higher financial need. Uh, it's a very, very difficult uh, environment for higher ed and and the federal programs, particularly things like Pell that are tied to financial need, the cost of those programs begin to skyrocket too. So there's a lot of cyclical impacts that happen. Again, we don't know exactly what might happen if we default. We've never done it, uh, but it's not going to be good news. Uh, very unlikely to be anything uh, other than a lot of hardship for people. Yeah. And there seems to be at least bipartisan agreement that it will be bad if it does happen. 
Yeah. Um, Although how bad seems to be a matter of dispute, but yeah. Right. Right. But you, you started out by talking about, there's only one thing that Congress needs to get done uh, this year and it's the debt limit. And actually there's a few other things that they're working on. Um, I've been following the national defense authorization act um, as I do every year. And they've actually started scheduling um, the markup, at least in the House, of that bill at the end of May. And, you know, it's been interesting because the last couple of years, as as Congress has kind of stopped passing bipartisan legislation frequently or as often as they previously did, you know, the NDAA has become that vehicle um, for a lot of amendments, some of which don't really relate to defense. Um, but I think this year, you know, as we've seen in previous year, we're going to see a flurry of language around research security, around um, uh, relationships uh, between institutions of higher education and China. Um, I've already seen some language um, around Confucius Institutes, of which, you know, there's only five, I think, named Confucius Institutes still in the United States, but obviously still a concern um, for Congress. And so I think that I'm going to be very busy at least um, this month and into the summer um, on NDAA. So while they're working on the debt limit, I think they'll still be moving the NDAA forward. And I know um, appropes, right? The, yeah. the annual appropriations process that actually funds the federal government is starting and there's been hearings um, asking for agency heads and secretaries to go up and defend the president's budget request. Yeah, I mean, there's been a number of hearings. I think probably more importantly, uh, the House has already announced that they're going to start doing markups of their bills, uh, really starting mid-May and moving forward through the subcommittees and out to the full committees. That's obviously important for a lot of reasons, moving the bills forward. But one of the things about these bills is they now have a level, right? They I talked about that FY22 levels, the cuts mm. to uh, the non-defense side of the budget. Uh, these bills are going to be marked up at those levels. You know, you know, I said earlier, right, a 22, 23% cut in funding. Um, you're going to have to start seeing proposals put forward that are going to implement cuts at that level in the House. And again, it's highly unlikely that that will be the ultimate outcome. It's, it would be very surprising if at the end of these negotiations on the debt ceiling, uh, the president and, and congressional Democrats agreed to go along with cuts at that level. But we're going to see proposals that are going to have very scary numbers in them, things that are going to slash student aid programs. The idea mm -hmm. of certain programs being proposed for elimination entirely seems very likely when we start to see these bills coming out of committee. Um, you know, I don't want to frighten people. This That will not be what we ultimately see. This is a long process. It involves mm -hmm. lots of parties uh, and extended negotiations. Probably won't be resolved till closer to the end of the year. But the early phase is going to look very worrisome for higher ed. Yeah, and obviously the Senate is going to be at a completely different place. So I think more so than in previous years, there's going to be a lot of differences um, between those bills. And will there even be a way for them to conference um, those two together? Yeah, I... <laughs> Even in the best of times, that hasn't really worked out the last few years, right? I mean, the House, because it's the House and the structure of the House, they have always moved their bills for the most part through the you know the appropriations bills through the process. Uh, the Senate side, we have not really seen the same process through the Senate in part because mm -hmm. it's harder to move bills uh, through majority control in the Senate. Um, we have seen for the past few years, frankly, the Senate simply announcing what their levels will be, putting bills out that they don't mark up, that they don't put to a vote. Uh, and then the negotiations go on at, you know, really a pretty limited leadership level. It's, it's senior leadership looking at the top lines. Once those top lines are determined, that filters down to the bill. So we will see really, you know, frightening numbers from the House side. We probably won't see anything from the Senate side until we get past the debt limit, until we get a little bit further down the road. And there's some clarity about, you know, where there could be agreement on overall spending. Again, most likely to be at the end of the year, most likely if passed his prologue, you know, big omnibus bills, wrapping it all together in one way, mm -hmm. uh, where that ultimately ends up, hard to say. We haven't had uh, quite the commitment to budget cuts uh, that we're seeing from the House Republicans in the last few cycles, but but obviously if failure to do so means the government shuts down, 
there is some motivation to do that. Government shutdowns are politically unpopular. We're in a really important election cycle. I don't think either party wants to be seen as causing those kinds of disruptions. Easy for me to say, who knows, but uh, we're at the beginning of a long process and frankly, one that's a lot more complicated looking than it has for the past few years. Yeah, and we we got a question about who's lobbying for higher education interests in Congress while these discussions are going on. And I mean, of course, I would say the American Council on Education were very active in making sure that members of Congress understand the importance of robust funding for our institutions, for student aid, for uh, research funding, and we will continue um, to carry that message. Um, but John, beyond kind of what Congress is working on, the Department of Education has been extremely busy. And I know um, when we were at the annual meeting, there was a lot going on um, regarding third party servicers and a guidance letter that the department had put out that had caused a lot of concerns about how institutions were going to have to report third party servicers or TPS services. And, and where, where does that stand? Yeah, this has all been uh, quite a whirlwind of, and, and frankly, really unusual in, in a way that we haven't really seen around uh, guidance from the Department of Education. Uh, I think people probably, if you were joining this uh, session, have some basic familiarity with the issues. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but uh, mid-February, the department put out guidance that really radically changed the definition of what a third-party servicer is essentially outside entities that contract with institutions to do things. Traditionally, it's been understood as sort of administrative support for the financial aid office. Uh, the new revised definition that the department put out would pull in a huge number of entities uh, that we've never before considered third-party servicers. Um, it raised a lot of concerns. It raised a lot of concerns from lots of different areas of higher education. AC filed uh, a comment letter to the Department of Ed uh, that had 85 different organizations on it. Uh, maybe more importantly, even than the broad community letter was that there are about a thousand other comments overwhelmingly from institutions themselves talking about what this would mean for them, made it really clear what the impact would be for individual institutions. And to their credit, the Department of Education saw that, they reviewed the information, they reviewed the comments, and very quickly they reversed themselves. Um, kind of unusual, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The comments were due on a Thursday, uh, and then on the subsequent, or I guess a week and a half later in a blog post, the Department of Education announced that they were uh, indefinitely suspending this guidance, that they would say uh, schools, it will only go into effect six months after revised guidance is put out. Schools wouldn't have to report on those relationships until that same point. So really functionally, there is a huge amount of time before we see this. And frankly, we may never really see that uh, coming out given some of the backlash and the concerns they have. Now, the big qualifier there is one of the topics that the department is looking at for negotiated rulemaking, which is this mm -hmm. process by which the Department of Education brings stakeholders together to negotiate around different regulatory proposals. Uh, they're looking to do a big rulemaking session this year. One of those topics is third-party servicers. So they mm -hmm. will have an opportunity to bring in representative institutions and student groups and consumer groups and, and accreditors and all sorts of others to talk about what this might look like. Maybe you know get a little bit more informed discussion around where changes mm -hmm. could come from. Uh, underlying all of this, Really, we're talking about third-party servicers. What the department is really thinking about is online program managers. They're thinking about the relationships colleges and universities have with uh, outside entities that, in many cases, provide educational content, uh, program administration, other services to institutions. That's what they're getting at. So that's likely to be what the bulk of that rulemaking process mm -hmm. is about. Um, yeah. And negotiated rulemaking takes, you know, quite a while to actually go through because, um, you know, guidance, obviously the department thought we can issue this and um, institutions will have to start responding immediately. But, you know, negotiated rulemaking is such a, a, a much more involved process. And um, you talked about the fact that TPS is going to be one of the one of the topics. But can you talk a little bit about the calendar um, and how long it's going to take? 
Sure. And and there are six other topics the department proposed in addition to third-party servicing. And they also asked about income-driven repayment plan changes. Mm -hmm. These That plan I talked about that the House uh, bill would have barred them from going forward with, mm -hmm. uh, they want comments on that as well. Uh, they just closed as of Monday, uh, the comment period for people to say what they thought about those topics mm -hmm. did not get a very strong response. Uh, I filed AC's comments Monday night, and at that point, only 10 other comments had been filed. You know, Some may have come mm -hmm. in after we did ours, but not a strong response. It's really just, I think, a recognition of the fact that the topics the department has put forward in previous rounds of rulemaking are generally the ones they've then gone ahead with the rulemaking on. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're likely to pursue those seven that I referenced. Now that they've closed that period for the comments and topics, we expect to see probably within a month or so, uh, the department formally announced that they're moving forward on rulemaking on those seven issues uh, and then ask for negotiators to be nominated. This is a process by which you know, associations and institutions and other organizations look at the different spots that are reserved for negotiators at the table and submit people they think would be good candidates to, to represent the interests of their sector uh, in those negotiations. The expectation here in DC is that they will assemble the negotiating panels, announce them, and then begin rulemaking sessions probably in September. And, and what they have done so far, which is traditional, is to do three rounds of rulemaking, one each month, each taking about a week. So you'd see one week in September, one week in October, one week in November. Uh, that's the likeliest outcome. Again, these are big technical issues that they're talking about, things like uh, return to Title IV and cash management, accreditation, distance education. Mm -hmm. These are not really simple or you know easy to grasp concepts. So getting this right, having a lot of informed technical expertise at the table is going to be important. That's why the comments that we did file around the topics essentially didn't speak to the topics themselves, but said, it's really important that you start thinking about splitting up these topics into different committees because the trend has been one rulemaking committee that covers seven, eight, ten issues, uh, usually very different in terms of what they are. And that for things like this that are so technical, having the right experience at the table is going to be really important uh, to getting it right. So instead of trying to find you know, 20 or so people who have expertise across all of these areas, which is just highly unlikely you'd be able to do mm -hmm. that. Uh, we're asking them to think about splitting it up in a way that makes a little bit more sense so that you have the right people at the table for that. Well, you know, in the lead up to the presidential election um, next year, which I know is going to be really exciting time here in DC, mm -hmm. being sarcastic if folks can't hear that <laughs> over the... <laughs> Um, over the mic, but um, you know, once something is goes through actual rulemaking, it's much harder to unwind for the next administration. I mean, they have to go through their own rulemaking process, um, and that's something that we saw um, with the Trump administration when they when they did Title IX. Unlike other, you know, things that the Trump administration did through executive authority, through letters or through guidance, um, it, you know, the Biden administration couldn't just unwind the Title IX um, campus sexual assault rules. And so, you know, we are still waiting for those final rules to come out around that. But we did see something on Title IX um, college athletics. And can you say a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so, and this came out partly as a result of the negotiations around the broader Title IX package and, and particularly the Biden administration's response undoing the Trump administration's regulations that they had uh, passed around Title IX. Um, and the emerging issue in states, particularly we've seen this, around bans on participation in women's sports by uh, trans uh, students who identify as women, whose gender identity aligns with uh, uh, women. Um, the Department of Education essentially announced that they would they would address this issue in a separate Title IX rulemaking. Uh, for a while, uh, there was an expectation we'd see that relatively soon. It took a while, but uh, the department released it uh, the beginning of last month. Uh, they have it out for comment. Uh, the rule is kind of interesting, right? Uh, th there was some expectation that they would very uh, rigorously block uh, bans on participation mm -hmm. by trans students in college athletics. And, and I should say in athletics generally, because it's K-12 as well as higher ed. 
but that's not what they actually proposed. Instead, what they said was each institution has the responsibility to determine really on a sport by sport basis, not a broad policy even for their campus, mm -hmm. uh, but on a sport by sport basis, the ability of students to participate in athletics by their, you know, that, as it relates to their gender identity. And the only sort of criteria you can use to make those evaluations uh, is around issues of uh, competitiveness and competitive fairness and safety mm -hmm. of the student athletes. It's an interesting, uh, you know, regulation in particular because a lot of times we tend to see very specific requirements and regulations on institutions. The federal government setting rules that are, you know, very clear. You have to do X, Y, and Z, and you have to do them. In, in this manner. And this is really leaving it up on an institution by institution basis on a sport by sport basis within the institution, how you make those determinations. In some cases, that's probably a really good thing. It gives schools the flexibility to think about their mission and their campus culture and how they approach athletics uh, and make the determinations that make the most sense for them. On the flip side, this is an incredibly controversial issue. Uh, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the flurry of state legislation in this area which is getting a lot of public attention, which is getting a lot of media attention, um, it's going to put institutions in a difficult place. You have to make those determinations, again, not just institution-wide, but on a sport-by-sport -sport basis. And there will likely be people, regardless of the determination, who are unhappy with what you decided. And without a, you know, without that clear prescriptive uh, federal rule mm -hmm. saying you have to do X, Y, and Z, then the challenge falls on that institution's you know, uh, choices there. So it's a difficult place in some ways for institutions to be in. Um, comments are coming up. I think there's a lot of concern, particularly from the institutional side, about what this looks like in being implemented, not just the issues I talked about, but you, know, you think about athletics, almost all athletics take place under the spectrum of uh, conference participation, right? At, at all levels of uh, collegiate athletics, mm -hmm. most institutions participate in a conference. Those can be you know, very local or they can cross multiple states and regions. Uh, how you determine the fact that every institution is responsible for making their own individual determinations, what that means for competitive fairness and, and, and equity issues and others, across a conference where institutions may be making very different decisions, that's going to be hard to sort out. And the, and the rule doesn't allow for that sort of collaborative approach to making those determinations. So a lot to follow here, really, again, you know, a very charged issue area, one that's getting a lot of public uh, scrutiny and attention. Uh, and it really will, once implemented, I think, put institutions in a difficult position of thinking through very clearly what their policies are and how they how they implement them and how they justify them to the public. Do you think that's one that's likely to end up in the courts? I, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a pretty safe assumption. Uh, yeah. you know, that, that's what we've talked about a lot with the bigger Title IX package, the assumption that mm. as soon as it is finalized, there will be legal challenges. My guess is that would be the case here. That, you know, And something sort of worth noting is you know, the athletics piece came out of the discussions uh, around the broader Title IX uh, uh, guy regulations. How these are going to be coordinated, will they be finalized around the same time? What's the release schedule? I think people still are very unsure of how that will work. So you may have them be introduced, finalized two separate points in time, both separate, you know, subject to separate court challenges. Maybe they'll be finalized at the same time, put forward as a total package, just not clear at this point. That's great. So a lot going on in DC. It sounds like I did miss a little bit of stuff while I was out. <laughs> um, but we we have some we do have some questions that were submitted beforehand, and and I just remind everybody listening, um, or who are participating in our live podcast, to please submit questions through the chat. Um, and one question that we had, John, was um, the College Transparency Act. This has yep. been something that a lot of the higher education community has championed over the years. It's been introduced to in multiple Congresses. It's been reintroduced now in this Congress. Um, does it have a path forward? Is it is this the year that we will see it passed? Yeah, you know, this is College Transparency Act. So it was reintroduced this week on Tuesday. Um it keeps gaining momentum. There's some things where you look at and you say, this might be the Congress where there's a chance for it to advance. I should say uh, AC uh, is supportive of the College Transparency Act. We would like to see it advanced uh, and enacted into law. Um, 
some things are positive signs if, if you are supportive of its passage. The lead uh, Republican sponsor of the College Transparency Act in the Senate is now the ranking member on the uh, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, uh, Senator Cassidy of Louisiana. So that is a very powerful position to be in, and you have a piece of legislation that uh, is very clearly identified with you. Uh, <laughs> and somebody just asked, what does it do? Which is a very good question, right? Maybe yeah, we should have started there, Sarah. Sorry, uh, sorry. The College Transparency Act does a few things, but the most important thing it does is it would create a uh, student unit record level database at the Department of Education. Uh, people might be surprised to know this or maybe not, but the Department of Education doesn't have a lot of information on students. They have data on students who get financial aid, which is roughly two thirds of all students, mm -hmm. but that's a big portion of the student population. They don't have any information on when they start, when they complete. Uh, CTA would have uh, a lot more information. It would do things, for instance, like allow us to understand how often students transfer between schools. Right now, the Department of Education can't follow somebody when they move from school to school. So it would provide an incredibly rich data set to help us better understand the implications of you know, federal policy on student outcomes, uh, institutional and programmatic level uh, implications for students, where we're seeing successes, where we might not be seeing successes, give us just a much clearer picture of what's happening in higher ed. Uh, that's what the bill proposes to do. Um, and again, possibilities, there's a strong advocate for it now and a, a position of prominence in the Senate. The counterpoint, though, is one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, opponent of the College Transparency Act is uh, Representative Virginia Fox, who is now the chair of the House Education Workforce Committee. Uh, she is a very strong opponent of this bill and has been for a long time, uh, you know, really has zero interest in seeing this advance. And in many ways, especially since she is in the majority in the House, that's a stronger position to block it than Senator Cassidy in the Senate has to advance it. Uh, that's been the dynamic for a long time. There's essentially not enough ability to get agreement between the parties and between the chambers to move it forward. Mm -hmm. It's been proposed in a number of areas, added to other bills as an amendment text. Um, there will continue to be efforts to move it forward. You know, never say never, but uh, with Virginia Fox in that position, it is hard to see a clear path forward. Yeah, we've seen this attached to um, the NDAA in the past. I think there was also... Um, uh, there, there was an attempt to try and move it as part of chip, the Chips and Science Bill, which passed last year. Um, but, you know, when these things get attached, it usually has to go back to the four corners or the authorizing committees, and they have to give sign off to allow it to move forward. And I think you're right. I don't think Chairwoman Fox is going to be supportive of that. Now, there is a lot, also a lot of bipartisan support for short-term Pell, and last year they tried to package the two things together. So I don't know if if that will help move it forward, but I think we'll at least see it try and move um, yeah. this year. I think that's a great point too, Sarah, and, and a little bit of insight into how these decisions are made. A lot of times when they're put as part of a bigger bill, as you pointed out, uh, the four corners, the chairs and ranking members of the relevant committees in the House and the Senate, uh, essentially, they're asked if they approve of it, and they're asked by the leadership who's trying to shepherd the bill forward. Uh, you know, you wonder why one of the four can block something. Well, it's because mm -hmm. leadership is weighing hundreds of possible pieces of legislation, and they just don't want a problem, right? Like, there are many things where they can get bipartisan consensus, consensus between the two chambers. That's easy to move forward if even one member objects. Uh, it can really throw a roadblock into getting that considered as part of a final package. So that is part of the problem here. Still, again, as you point out, could be bundled with things that have bipartisan support like mm -hmm. Workforce Pell. So, you know, never say never, just, uh, you know, <laughs> the chair of the uh, authorizing committee <laughs> being an opponent is a big obstacle to overcome. Yeah, a pretty big one. So speaking of bipartisan legislation, um, the FAFSA simplification that passed a few years ago with bipartisan support, but the department is working to implement it. Um, where where are they on that? Yeah, and this is another one, kind of like TPS, it's been a bit of a saga. So, and actually kind of relevant to some of the other things we talked about too. FAFSA simplification was bill, it was included in a big end of year spending bill. Uh, so it wasn't passed on its own sort of through traditional, you know, lawmaking order. 
Uh, and by and large, we think that this is going to be a good thing. It is simplifying the form. It should help more students uh, access financial aid, uh, particularly around things like Pell Grants. There's a very clear benefit that we think more students will be eligible for Pell Grants, and a larger percentage of those students will receive a larger Pell Grant as a result. Um, around the other aid uh, eligibility, it's harder to tell because we haven't seen these changes in action. Um, but more importantly, the department's having a really hard time doing this, and, and understandably so. This is both complicated and really important. Um, they have been trying. They were supposed to have everything in place last year. They knew that they couldn't do it, so Congress essentially gave them a one-year extension. They have to do it by this year. The goal, really, the target deadline has always been October 1st. October 1st is a deadline that we use for FAFSA. We've gone to a, what's you know an early FAFSA application in the last few years. That's primarily to help low-income students uh, have more time to see what their aid offers are, look at them across different institutions, help inform their search so that they have you know, the most information they can make when they're trying to make a decision about an institution. It's also really important to schools because it gives them additional time for enrollment decisions and to understand what aid applications is to help shape a class as, as they're considering enrollment and admissions decisions. Um, the department's going to miss that October 1st deadline. They've announced this publicly. They have said it would take, uh, they will be able to have the FAFSA out sometime in December. Originally, they said early December. Now they're talking more about maybe mid-December. Uh, they are required by law to have it in place by January 1st. They have said absolutely they will hit that target, but they seem to be creeping closer and closer to that January 1st deadline as it is. It will only happen this year. That, that delay will only happen this year. It should be in place for next year. It will return to normal operations, the October 1st target date. Uh, but it's going to be meaningfully impactful. We, you know, we were at our annual meeting and I don't know, you were in sessions with me, Sarah, right? Like how many people stood up and said, look, by yeah. November, I've already packaged 7,000 students, mm -hmm. right? I've already made admissions application, you know, acceptances out to 11,000 students. This is going to have a big impact on campuses and, and in particular, a big impact on low-income students who are the ones we're most worried about, right? Like the, who have the mm -hmm. hardest time you know, entering college and, and, you know, managing the system. So it is a problem. The department, to their credit, is doing as much as they can. They take the seriousness of this uh, to heart. They want to make sure there aren't the kind of problems you see sometimes when, you know, programs are rolled out by the federal government. They are doing what they can to assure quality here. Uh, and they're working on, frankly, limited resources. The The last funding bill did not give the Federal Student Aid Office, the office that oversees this at the Department of Education, uh, kept them level funding, so no new money. You think about all the other things they're being asked to do around loan forgiveness and student loan repayment resumption, all these big other things they have to do, as well as change the entire financial aid calculation system. It's not surprising mm -hmm. they're having a hard time with it, especially without any additional resources. That said, you know, we can't ignore those concerns. These are really meaningful to institutions, really meaningful to low-income students, uh, and frankly, an area of great concern for us right now. So speaking of deadlines, uh, the department also recently uh, granted an extension for the spending of HERF dollars, the Higher Education Emergency Relief Funds uh, that were included in the COVID relief bills. Uh, what, what's the new deadline, John? And does anybody still have HERF dollars left to spend? Yeah, so it's actually, I I spoke with uh, Politico about this last week, I think, uh, and I was a little bit surprised by the amount. It's not that much. The department estimates that there's roughly $5.5 billion in unspent HERF funds. These were the COVID relief funds, the higher education emergency relief funds that came out of the COVID bills. Um there were approximately 700 institutions that still have some money left that they haven't spent out. Uh, this is actually in kind of marked contrast to K-12, where there are tens of billions of dollars that have not been obligated mm -hmm. yet. Uh, and, you know, we, we've been tracking this money for a while, really, you know, throughout the process. What we've heard from campuses is that it, this is not sort of an omission. It's not like they forgot they had uh, HERF money lying around. It's that in a lot of cases you have things like you contracted with a vendor, say a telehealth mm -hmm. provider for mental health services, and you pay them monthly and you have a contract for two years. So you're holding mm -hmm. the money, but paying it out over time or other things you, you know, 
your uh, air uh, ventilation system, you want to add purification elements to it. Well, everybody was doing that during the pandemic. So supply mm -hmm. chain issues and other things made the equipment and the, the vendors who could install it for you harder to access. You might have budgeted money towards that and simply not been able to spend that money out because the equipment's not available, the vendors who install it are busy with other things. Uh, it's not like you're not using it. It's just obligated, but you haven't had the ability to spend it. So, you know, relatively not that much money in the grand scheme of things, only again, about five and a half billion out of about 77 billion total uh, relative to a lot of the other COVID relief programs where you see, we talked about the house bill would rescind a lot of that uh, COVID relief money. Higher Ed's done a great job. Higher Ed got the money in and got the money out uh, to, you know, students in particular, the student aid portion of that went out the door very quickly. The institutional side, there is some remaining money, but again, usually it's it's very much accounted for and obligated institutional expenses. So, you know, something track, the department is offering extensions. You have to apply for an extension of one more year. Uh, last year, they granted them automatically. Uh, for those institutions in those situations I talked about, uh, they will apply, is very likely the department will accept it, but it's good due diligence by the department. They want you to explain why you need it, an extension, why you need the additional time. They're not looking to penalize institutions. They just want to make sure that these are thoughtful and intentional decisions by a campus before they grant the extension. So, John, we have about four minutes left, and it might be good just to um, wrap up with a kind of looking forward to the summer um, type thing, what we're what we're waiting for. Somebody asked about Department of Labor uh, rules around um, FLSA, which has to do with um, uh, exempt employees and non-exempt employees and who you're paying overtime. I think that's something that we're going to continue to watch for to see whether or not it's going to be issued this summer. Um, we also have the Title IX rules, the, the large package that we're waiting to see if that happens this summer. And then one of the big things that we're watching is the UNC Harvard race conscious yeah. admissions case um, that the Supreme Court is expect, expected to issue a ruling on. And I know we talked a lot about that at our recent annual meeting. Yeah, that, I mean, that I, you and I both have the same experience there. I don't know how many presidents and other senior administrators wanted to talk about that and what the possible impact will be. Um, and I should say, actually, at that meeting, we had a session led by, or organized, I should say, by AC's general counsel, Pete McDonough, where you had uh, general counsels and, and college presidents and other folks talking about uh, what the environment looks like, what schools can do to prepare, what schools can do to keep uh, building diverse classes if, as is widely expected, the Supreme Court strikes down the consideration of race and admissions. It's a difficult situation. We have looked at all sorts of things. You know, I know Georgetown Center for Education and Workforce did a report on this where they looked at alternative methods schools use to increase the diversity of their classes. And found that, you know, while helpful, all of them fall short of being able to consider race and admissions. We did our own research at AC where we looked at states that had implemented bans on the consideration of race and admissions. And what you found out when you looked at those states is that uh, for selective institutions, even in states where population, you know, enrollment overall was jumping by double digit percentages, uh, the percentage of black students, for instance, declined. So even as overall enrollment was surging at those institutions, the percentage of the black students there declined. You flip that around to open access institutions, places that are admitting 80% or more of their applicants. And in states where you bought, you know, banned the consideration of race, even those states where enrollment overall was declining by huge percentages, the percentage of students of color at those institutions, the open access ones, grew significantly. So you are seeing a market impact of a shift away from selective institutions to less selective institutions of students of color in those states. That is likely what we will see nationally when the Supreme Court rules. Other things to consider the Supreme Court is looking very much, there seems likely that uh, consideration of race as it relates to an individual's lived experience might still be part of the admissions process, but uh, you know it will undoubtedly have an impact on what our college classes look like, especially at selective institutions. But yeah, Sarah, lots to look forward to. Not all of it, sadly, uh, good news, but um, much going on and, and much going uh, forward. Mm -hmm. I, we're just about to wrap up time-wise. Is there any final thoughts? Yeah. No, I would just say, you know, I think uh, we talk about this a lot. 
although it doesn't seem like Congress is moving many things forward, we're staying very busy uh, talking about the importance of higher education. And so I think for this group, there will still be a lot to update them next month. Yep. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for the very good and thoughtful questions. Uh, Sarah mentioned we, you know, are really liking our live uh, podcast and and dot uh, edu live opportunity. So hey, you know, uh, invite us to your campus, right? Like we'd love to come out and and do this uh, with a live audience again and and have some fun and meet with people. So thanks again for joining us, and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. As always, you can check out earlier episodes and subscribe to .edu on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. For show notes and links to the resources mentioned in the episode, you can go to our website at acenet.edu backslash podcast. Well there, please take a short survey to let us know how we're doing. You can also email us at podcast at acenet.edu to give us suggestions on upcoming shows and guests. And finally, a very big thank you to the producers who helped pull this podcast together. Lori Arnston, Audrey Hamilton, Malcolm Moore, Anthony Trueheart, Rebecca Morris, Jack Nicholson, and Fatma Gong. They do an incredible job making this happen and making John Mushtaq and I sound as good as possible. Finally, thank you so much to all of you for listening.